Helen and Lewis, and tonight I will be in conversation with our guest, Catherine Page Harden, a psychologist and behavioural geneticist. She is Professor of Psychology at the University of Texas in Austin, where she's also leader of the Developmental Behaviour Genetics Lab and the co-director of the very cool sounding Texas Twin Project. Her new book, here we go, is The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality. Now, our event tonight is going to run for about an hour. Half of that will be me and half of that will be you asking questions. So just look out for the box at the bottom of your screen and ask away. Um, Paige, I want to start where the book starts, which is with children um, and maybe with your children. What did having kids teach you that working as a genetics researcher didn't? I think in many ways it wasn't about teaching me something different, but just really driving home the forces of, of lessons that you can hear about in the abstract, but you, the felt reality of them isn't really real until you have kids. And that lesson is that children are different from one another. And even children within the same family are different from one another. So often when we think about genetics, we're thinking about similarity between parents and children. And that's true, but thinking about genetics just in terms of similarity elides the fact that there is so much variation within families. My children are different from one another in their personality, in their temperament, in their speech and language development, in how they do in school. I think most parents see those differences play out in their lives. As a geneticist, I just had tools, I think, ready to understand those differences and thinking about how they fit with a larger pattern of what we see in the population. Children are not born exactly the same. And why did you want to write this book? Because I should say that every time I've seen this book mentioned, it has been with a kind of, oh, Catherine Page Harden has stepped into the bear cage, you know, like she's done what, you know, she's put her hand into this hornet's nest. So with that, we'll talk a bit about why, you know, this subject is very controversial later, but, but what was the thing that you wanted to say? What do you think needs saying on this subject? I think there's two things that need saying. One is that, the DNA revolution is here, that science is accelerating by leaps and bounds. And I think that that advanced technology is going to really influence people's lives, sort of regardless of what they do. Um, you know, the, the DNA revolution is here to stay. So I think it's important for people un to understand what are scientists doing with that information? How do we link genetics, not just to things like height or disease? but to things like intelligence or personality or how far children go in school. Um, so part of the goal in writing this book was to explain the science and clear up a lot of myths and misunderstandings around the science. And then my second goal in writing the book is so often that research of linking genetics to differences between people that we care about um, is told in terms of one story, that it naturalizes inequality, that it, genetics is sort of an enemy of equality. And I personally don't see it that way. I, I am approaching this topic not just as a scientist, but as someone who is personally, morally, and politically committed to egalitarianism, to political equality between people. Um, and there didn't really seem to be any space in the conversation around genetics that it paid attention to that. How can we think about equality in a world of difference, um, in particular in genetic difference? And so I thought it was important to describe how I, as someone who's committed to equality, and but also has spent a lot of time, time thinking about the science and its limitations, think of these things going together. So let's talk about the two, you know, troublesome intellectual traditions. First of all, the tradition of eugenics. So that's a phrase coined by Francis Galton, a Victorian scientist at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, who also came up with the idea of nature versus nurture, this idea that we need to try and separate out what things are caused by environment and what things mm -hmm. by, um, by inheritance. He actually wrote a very weird novella about, you know, um, a eugenic paradise, as he saw it, where people were kind of given breeding licenses, essentially. And and as we know, those ideas were taken up in U.S. states where some people who were deemed mentally disabled were sterilized and then later by the Nazis. So how how much of that was in your mind when you were writing the book that you need to be writing to counter to a particular tradition that's been about classifying people as feeble minded or whatever else it might be? I mean, that tradition loomed really large in my mind in writing the book, but I think more generally in doing the science, a big part of responsible science communication isn't just talking about what is the science saying, but also what is the science not saying. 
thing, not just how should it be used, but how should it not be used. And particularly when we're talking about genetics in relation to education or intelligence, that history to anyone who's even had like a, you know, a passing knowledge of the early 20th century in the UK and Germany and the US immediately is aware of um, the potential dangers. Is this knowledge going to be misused? Are we going to um, animate or reanimate these ugly ideas about inferiority and superiority? Um, and I think in particularly in an American context where um, the reproductive rights debate more generally is so contentious and acrimonious, um, there's also that history, um, when we're talking about the history of eugenics in the U.S., we're talking about involuntary sterilization, we're talking about women being deprived of very basic reproductive rights. Um, so thinking about that history was um, important both in terms of trying to um, articulate why that work is not necessary, why the research is not necessarily going to lead to these pernicious ends, but also challenging me to think about well, what is it for? If it's not going to be co-opted by the most pernicious voices, if we're not thinking about um, connecting genes to intelligence for the purposes of this dystopian control of people's reproduction, what can we use it for? What is the good of it? So um, thinking about the lessons of the past and how we can carry those forward um, is a theme that runs throughout the entire book, I think. Did it make you feel more that you had to be humble about the limits of science? Because I think one of the things that comes across most strongly when you read about eugenics in the early 20th century is how incredibly intellectually respectable it was. You know, this wasn't a couple of fringe scientists. You know, they were naming a department mm -hmm. uh, at King's College and they had kind of the, in the, the golden chair of eugenics, you know, the eugenics department, the eugenics mm -hmm. review was a magazine. You know, this was, and this wasn't, as we would now, I think, associate it with the, with the right. This was the Fabian Society founders were eugenicists. You know, this was seen as a kind paternal thing to to do to help the underclass, as they would have been seen then. And mm -hmm. and that's a story about being humble in the face of what what scientists can convince themselves are good ideas, right? Mm -hmm. I think w they, they can convince themselves of their good ideas, but I think they can also convince themselves that being um, really good at one thing generalizes to expertise in a lot of domains. You know, I think Galton is a great example of that. He was a brilliant mind in some areas. When we think about his illustrations of the normal distribution and how it could arise from a series of binary events, that is a real insight. That kind of insight, however valuable, um, doesn't necessarily generalize to then making sweeping social recommendations that infringe on the rights of others. So the lesson for me in that is not just being humble about the limits of your science, but also being humble about how you know expertise in one domain. I think often when people, particularly men, are good in one domain, people other people sort of rush in to make them authorities on many things. Um, and I think there's a lesson in the dangers of that to here. Oh, I think that's, I, yeah, I mean, I've, I'm fascinated by the idea of the kind of who gets to be a public intellectual and the idea that because yes. you are yes. a brilliant scientist, suddenly people think that you know how best to organize a political system. And you think, why, you know, why would this, it's not like artists are also brilliant plumbers. Like, I just don't know why you would make those assumptions. <laughs> but you, you, you did try and read quite widely outside your discipline. There's a lot of John Rawls, for example, in the book. Mm -hmm. So what else were you reading mm -hmm. to try and complement your expertise in genetics? So I was reading a lot of political philosophy and philosophy of science, and that work was supported by actually a really interesting grant from the John Templeton Foundation that brought together half of the fundees were behavioral scientists or genetic scientists, and the other half of the fundees were philosophers of science or scientists whose work touched on um, distributive or retributive justice some in some way. And there's actually so few opportunities as a scientist to spend time not just reading, but being in conversation, writing papers with, presenting your work to um, people in the humanities who have training around the philosophy of science and these disciplines. So that experience was really um, foundational to writing the book. So often of the conversations around genetics are not really around genetics. They're around fairness. They're around equality. They're around justice. And I didn't want to just say, 
well, this is what the science says, and here are my opinions on these other issues. I wanted to say, well, there's a whole philosophical literature that considers what do we do with luck when we in our conversations of equality. And then there's a whole new emerging genetic science about how the luck of the genetic draw affects our lives. How can we be more deliberate about linking these two areas of scholarship to one another? Um, and Rawls was a great fit for that because one of his you know, most enduring contributions to the philosophical literature is this idea of the veil of ignorance. You know, if you had no idea what your position was going to be, either in the outcome of the social lottery or what he called the natural lottery, how would you want society arranged? Um, and so that's what I'm encouraging many of the readers to think about. If we take the science of genetics seriously, and then you also consider what type of social structures, if you didn't know what your genotype was going to be, or you didn't know what your kid's genotype was going to be, how might, how might that give you new imaginings about what you consider a good society? Those are the questions I'm inviting the readers to consider. I was interested when I got to reading the book about how much more radical it was than I thought, because I was fully prepared to accept the idea that intelligence was partly heritable. And therefore, you know, that being intelligent isn't something you can boast about as if it's a personal achievement, because it is luck of the draw. But there's also stuff in there about the idea that grit, you know, that conscientiousness, that um, uh, lack of risk taking, you know, all of these things that are, are also correlated with success in life, educational attainment as it's currently set up those might also be partly heritable. And again, therefore, you can't really take credit for being hardworking or whatever it might be. That, that I think people will find incredibly challenging. I think it's really challenging because we're used to being able, we're used to, to, to the illusion that we're going to be able to kind of neatly carve up our lives into this part was luck and this is the part that I can take credit for. And the thing about genetics, and I think this is part of why it causes so much controversy, is that it really confounds those intuitions. Because if we're tracing out genetic influences on personality, for instance, your genes are something that you can't take credit for, like in terms of, I, you know, I'm very proud that I have this DNA sequence, right? That, that's like being very proud that I have green eyes. Um, but if those genes shape our biology in such a way that we are more likely to be persistent or are more likely to delay gratification or um, are less likely to have addiction problems or ADHD, then that line between agency and credit and desert, what we deserve and luck and, you know, there but for the grace of God go I, starts to get muddled to the point of disappearing, right? Um, so my point in the book is not that no one can take credit for anything in their lives. I, I think it would be kind of impossible as a human to go through our life without trying to think about this is the part I'm responsible for. This is what I need to try harder on. This is the, this is the thing that I can feel proud of accomplishing. Um, but it does suggest that any efforts to arrange a social order to mete out rewards according to what people deserve, it's going to it's going to rapidly run up into a point of kind of near impossibility from an empirical standpoint. You know, this is again a Rawlsian idea, where he says you know, none of the precepts of justice tend towards desert, right? Tend towards rewarding desert because it's impossible at a certain point. So if we're going to give up on the idea of separating things into what people deserve versus don't deserve then what we do, then, then how do we go about thinking about, about equality and fairness? And that's a really difficult uh, you know, question that I'm not giving a comprehensive answer to the book. I'm more bringing in the results of genetics to encourage people to think about those really difficult questions. About yeah, there's a very good example, I think, where you're talking about how you would design a school curriculum and trying to make the decision between, do you tilt it towards something that, you know, is, helps the bottom, say, you know, 10, 10 percent or you know are you having gifted and talented um programs that help the, the top 10 percent and that's so interesting because people are very happy to talk about things like um grammar schools you know in, in britain uh, and i guess the versions of those in the us too about programs that help all the already lucky i guess succeed even further mm -hmm. 
but it's not considered, you know, we don't, we don't have the conversation about how, whether or not that's happening at the expense of people who are, you know, you could move up from being terrible students to being, being slightly below average or average students. That's not seen as being such an exciting, you know, sexy conversation to have, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my, the example that I'm talking about there is, you know, when we look at many of the programs that we try in education, there's kind of two problems a, a, about them. And this is true in both the U.S. context and the U.K. context, which is that most of the things we try in education don't work. They don't make a difference on average for students. Um, if they do work, they, those effects fade out often or are very difficult to scale or replicate. And then even among the things that do work, even when they raise the average, they often also exacerbate the very inequalities that people talk about as their locus of concern. A classic example in a U.S. context is Sesame Street. So Sesame Street is, you know, Big Bird is on the TV and is talking about, you know, the word of the day or the letter of the day. And there's the count that introduces numbers. And the reason why we have this on public access television in the U.S. is that it was an effort to expose more low-income children to um, literacy and numeracy even before they started school because low-income children start kindergarten already behind high-income children in terms of their early school readiness skills. So Sesame Street works in the sense that children who watch Sesame Street read earlier, they read better. It, you know, schooling works. If you teach four-year-olds their letters and numbers, they learn them. It doesn't do what it was originally designed to do, which is to close income gaps, because even though it helps low income children, it helps middle and high income children more. So this is what a lot of people call a Matthew effect, where the rich get richer, the most, most advanced, you know, to whom already has gets even more. This is a pervasive problem in education. Um, it's. It's a problem that we can turn a blind eye to if we're ignoring genetic heterogeneity between students, because we know that there's these gaps between kids and how well they're, they're gonna do. Some part of that is based on their genotype, but most educators, most policymakers, most educational interventionists are not including genetic information at all in their studies. So who are our interventions serving? Are they all having these kind of Matthew effects where they're changing the mean but exacerbating inequality? The short answer is we don't really have a good answer to that question. And that lack of information allows people, this is circling back to answering your question, allows people to not be transparent about, well, what are your goals? What are your values in terms of designing this educational system? People can have very different goals about whether or not it's more important for them to maximize performance amongst a very few, versus raise the floor to a certain level. Um, but often people don't even have to commit to like, well, what is their vision of what this educational intervention or what this educational policy will do for inequality? Who is it intending to serve? Um, we act as if things that work, work for everyone and work for everyone the same way. And that's just not empirically true. So this is an example in which the, you know, neglecting the science allows people to kind of sweep under the rug some things that I, I think would be important policy conversations about you know what, what are people's values in terms of who they want to serve the most at different points in their educational trajectory. That was one of the things that I came across really strongly and actually it made me think about the fact that the underpinning of a lot of um, right-wing arguments in economic terms is about the idea that some, some level of inequality is good. You know, it's a spur to other people to do more, you know, that you want to have things that other people have that you don't. And and I thought that's really interesting. I actually haven't heard that vocalised. It doesn't come up much now because every, like equality is seen as such a buzzword and such an achievement of public policy. But you go back to rules in the book and saying that sometimes we might tolerate inequalities if they raise the level for everybody, right? It's all good for us to live in a society mm -hmm. where the occasional person gets to be a neurosurgeon or gets to, you know, be a, a, a superstar inventor because we all benefit from that. And, and yeah, I, I really like that it forced me into confrontation with saying, well, what are, you know, what are you prepared to tolerate for the, for the good of everybody? What level of inequality is, is right? And it's, it's a very fundamental policy question that weirdly gets dodged a lot these days, I think. I think it does get dodged or, or it gets shunted into a quality of education. And even that is kind of a dodge because what level of education are we talking about for whom? 
in the US, and I think this is also the case in the UK, there's a lot of emphasis on um, getting more people to university or equalizing university participation across groups, which I think is a good thing. I mean, I think university education for many people is a good in and of itself. But I too often I think that conversation distracts from, are we actually trying to equalize university participation? Or are we trying to equalize access to jobs that are secure and well-paying? Are we trying to um, uh, equalize the sorts of neighborhoods that people live in, in terms of their freedom from environmental toxins and level of um, you know, order and green space? Do we actually care about everyone having an equal likelihood of having a STEM bachelor's degree? Or is it just that we've we've piled up so many other things on top of being university educated in terms of access to a life without precarity in terms of access to power. And those are the things we're actually interested in equalizing, not everyone's mathematics ability at a certain level. Um, so all of that to say, I agree with you in that we can't have a conversation about just equality. I think we have to be very specific about a quality of what and are we interested in equality as a means to another end or as an end to itself? And I think those conversations are often alighted in many of our conversations about education. Yeah, I think the book has landed at a really interesting time, uh, you know, around these conversations. You, you referenced Freddie De Boer in there, whose book Cult of Smart makes some um, similar arguments about the fact that we have, you know, we've built up this idea where education is the be all and end all. And, and actually, is that necessarily the correct way to structure a society, as you say? The other way of looking at it is why have wages stagnated for people without a college degree for, for 20 years? And what kind of life can you build for yourself if you don't have higher education? And and the idea that, well, actually, we'll just make more people go into higher education is a kind of dodge out of that. The other moment that the book hits really well, um, you were obviously writing this and, and prepping it for publication in, uh, during last summer's protests, Black Lives Matter's protest over the um, death of George Floyd. And you're also... Another book that this is in the shadow of, another intellectual traditionist in the shadow of, is um, the book that Charles Murray co-authored, The Bell Curve. Can you explain uh, to the casual listener why that is such a controversial book in this field and why, because you explicitly repudiate it very early on in your book, and you obviously felt that you had to do that in order to get the ability to talk on the subject. So why does that loom so large over this conversation? I mean, the bell curve sold, I think, like 400,000 copies, which is an, an absolutely bananas number for a 900-page book that's mostly analyses of data from the, you know, the NLSY, which is the data set in the U.S. And it had several key arguments that there were genetic differences between people that influenced the development of traits such as intelligence, that intelligence test scores predicted... Um, something about class structure in American life, occupational outcomes, participation in the labor market more generally, income and the acquisition of wealth. Um, and those parts of the bell curve are very similar to the evidence that I present in my book. Um, what was controversial about the bell curve and, and the parts that I disagree with are points three and four. And so, which was that um, the differences between racial groups, uh, particularly between whites and Blacks in America could best be described in terms of genetics, um, at least partially in terms of genetics, and that the social inequalities that result from genetics are immutable or inexorable, unable to be addressed through social policy, that, you know, that, that some sort of version of the poor will always be with us because of their genes was the kind of ultimate conclusion of the bell curve. Whereas my book describes two things that I think are, are really important, and one is that race is not a genetic concept and that we don't really have any evidence that the sort of genetic differences that we observe within people who are homogeneously of European genetic ancestry explain these kind of racialized health and education disparities that we see across groups. Um, and two, yeah, I, I um, talk about why genetically caused differences can absolutely be ameliorated or addressed using environments, using social policies. Um, the classic example here, which was presented in the 1970s, is 
eyeglasses, right? Your genes might have caused you to have poor eyesight, but we are not crispr in your genes. We are putting on an environmental um, intervention. And there's several examples in my book of, um, you know, genes that cause something about an individual's, you know, interaction with their environment. And it's that in environment that we can intervene on to change that genetic relationship. So I think it's really important given how large the bell curve loomed in the, the American imagination, in particular, the strong claims it made around racialized genetic differences. Um, I felt in order for us to have a conversation about what the science does say, I need to be really clear up front about where my points of disagreement were, because if to the extent that people have, have thought about this topic before, very often their exposure is um, Murray and Hernstein's The Bell Curve. I was very surprised. I mean, actually not when I thought about it, but um, you, you point out that the vast majority of um, genetic research has been done on people of European ancestry. So we just don't have particularly good mapping for people of other, other heritages, which I thought was interesting. And then to go back to um, Galton in either Hereditary Genius or one of his other books, he talks about racialized differences in intelligence. And he has this idea that the classical Greeks were two standard deviations above modern Caucasians. And you're just like, where are you getting this from? Um, and, and the same thing comes up that you mentioned in, in the book, that the idea of what white was in the middle 20th century in America is specifically excluding, for example, Italians and, and Polish people, right? So these, the racial categories are, are, are incredibly slippy, even within recent memory. Is there any, yes. like, is there any, is all of this subject simply either too toxic or too riddled to pseudoscience, or are there interesting things to say about race and IQ, or is just the whole subject just should be walled off with a kind of radiation shield like Chernobyl? <laughs> I mean, I think the most interesting conversation about race and IQ that I have heard recently is by um, uh, Harriet Washington, who wrote A Terrible Thing to Waste. She is a scholar of color who has pushed back against kind of an American tradition of rejecting IQ tests as valuable and is saying they are valuable. They're valuable because they are sensitive to neurobiological insults and to the toxicity that we see from, say, exposure to lead. And she's suggesting, you know, we can look at IQ tests and use them as a really valuable tool for documenting the effects of environmental racism, that children of color in the U.S. are much more exposed to things we know are harmful for the development of intelligence, such as lead in pipes and in houses and in soil of formerly industrialized areas. Um, that is the part of the race IQ conversation where there's interesting science and there's more light than heat, right? Whereas I think the kind of Mer Hernstein Murray, let's speculate wildly in the absence of evidence about, you know, genetic differences between socially constructed racial groups. Um, I just find really dissatisfactory from a scientific perspective even just the idea of talking about Black people in the U.S. as this monolithic entity, you know, when we look at when we look at African ancestry groups, there is such incredible genetic diversity there. Two people from Africa can be as genetically different from each other as you are from someone from East Asia, and we collapse all that genetic diversity into this label that we've given to the descendants of slaves and. I just think calling enslaved people black and then treating that as a genetically homogenous group is it's scientifically ridiculous and it doesn't advance the science. It doesn't advance either the, the conversation or the science in any real meaningful way. But how, in what ways is IQ useful to talk about just as a concept? Because it did go through quite a backlash, you know, Stephen Jay Gould's mismeasure of man. And then there was a lot of work about, you know, do IQ tests just measure how good you are at IQ tests? Like, and then the really, the Terman research, you know, Lewis's Terman's research about, you know, very high IQ children, which didn't show that they were all like mini geniuses. I think quite famously, like the only one who won a Nobel Prize, like was, had their IQ was slightly too low to be in well, one of his yeah. termites. Yeah. But there are, yeah. to your mind, there are bits of IQ that are worth rehabilitating. Like it's a useful index on, on what kind of measures? Yeah. So I, there's really two very common extreme views on IQ and they're both wrong. So one extreme view is that there's nothing to it, that IQ just measures how good you are. IQ tests that it um, has no purpose other than sort of 
entrenching racist or classist bias. Um, and that's not true because we can see that performance on intelligence test scores um, predicts things that we care about in life. And it's, um, you know, I think the one of the most compelling research studies on this um, was done in Scotland, the Lothian birth cohort study, um, where, you know, following up on Scottish school children who were all tested on their IQ at age 11. And you see that those age 11 test scores predict things like how long people live, even above measures of their early social class. So, you know, what is, what is intelligence? What is G? is, you know, I think a topic that will be endlessly fascinating to psychologists and, you know, philosophers of the mind, whatever it's getting at, it's getting at a suite of abilities that are broadly useful in educational systems in high income countries, in labor markets, and um, in, you know, navigating an environment such that you have access to more sort of health promoting services. And the mechanisms of that are unclear, but I think the, the predictive value of IQ tests um, it's pretty incontrovertible. At the same time, it's not the end all be all of, of human skill, right? So the other extreme view is to talk about intelligence or G or IQ as G, if it's just to gloss that for people is talent. general intelligence, right? Yeah. That short general for... intelligence, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, that, that, you know, some people talk about that as if it's like talent writ, writ large or skill writ large, that it is a the marker of all the you know, useful things that humans can do with their body or brain. And that's also obviously not true. I mean, I think there's been increasingly pushback even against the language and economics. You know, often economists talk about skilled versus unskilled labor, skilled being labor that requires a college degree. But if you look at unskilled labor, whether that's being a plumber or being a waitress or being a farm worker, those are skills. Those are skills that are valuable. Um, they're just not skills that are necessarily inculcated at university. Um, they often require a lot of training and expertise. So I think we can think of it as both more useful but more limited than, than its advocates or its critics often um, portray it as. It is a really reliable measure of one domain of human cognitive functioning that's predictive of lots of things given the outsized role that formal education plays in modern American and British society, but it is not um, intelligence or reason, capital R, as the kind of the end all be all of, of, um, of human reasoning or human talent. I also think the problem with some of that skill discussion is there's a kind of tyranny of metrics about it, right? Like if you're a quant or, a, you know, you're working in some financial domain, it's quite easy to tell whether you're good at it or not, right? There is lots of data to supply performance data. If you're exact, like a home carer, we can obviously say that some people are much better at that, but it's much more nebulous to say you see problems before they come or you make people feel better about themselves or you're really warm. Like that's, there's no easy, you know, data led approach to some of that stuff. And I think that that strikes me quite strongly. I want to go back to the Lothian cohort because you mentioned age 11, and that's a very kind of totemic number in the UK because we used to have the 11 plus, which was what decided whether or not you went to grammar school, you were considered you know, a bright kid who was headed uh, for higher education, or whether or not you went to some, a technical college. Very controversial. There's still some grammar schools left. But, um, but you also write in the book about this idea of polygenic scores. So the idea that you can't, there's no one gene for intelligence, but there are a kind of suite of genes that you can look at and kind of come up with a profile. And I wonder when I was, I've read about the 11 plus about children who failed it and the fact that they then felt that was it, they were on the scrap heap at 11. Is it a good idea to know your polygenic score? Oh, that's so interesting. I think like every piece of information about yourself is it, going to have pros and cons. Um, I think a, the, the con of it would be if you misunderstand it as destiny, um, as something that's insurmountable um, or something that's stigmatizing. Um, at the same time, people like knowing about themselves. There's a reason why Ancestry.com and 23, you know, 23andMe are multi-million dollar businesses. Um, you can get genetic information about your likelihood of liking cilantro and like being bald as a baby. Um, so I think there's always going to be that um, push pull between uh, 
people like to know about themselves. People Tell me don't quickly like about um, cilantro, their which is coriander in the UK. There is some kind of genetic association <laughs> yes. with thinking it tastes like soap. Is that right? Or something like that? Yes, it is. It's actually um, a gene that's associated. And I think this is less polygenic. I think this is actually maybe mo monogenic, which is rare for almost anything we're going to talk about. Intelligence or schizophrenia, height, all influenced by thousands upon thousands of genes, each with small effect. But I'm pretty sure cilantro is a one gene of, of a relatively large effect, and it affects how you how you taste it. So for some people, it tastes like soap, and they you know they spit it out, um, they pick it off their tacos. Uh, whereas other people, it just you know love it. it Can't good. get it's enough of it. I'm in yeah. the I'm in the lucky <laughs> camp. I definitely know what version of that gene I've got. Um, it's time for me just to go to yeah. some questions. So people um, who are watching yeah. this can still ask them. Uh, you're very welcome to put them in the chat. Um, this question comes in from uh, I cannot see the name, but I will tell you it anyway. How can a better understanding okay. of genetic inheritance improve? Oh, Stella, how can a better understanding of genetic inheritance improve the education system? So, if you accept your premise, what is the policy outcome from that? I guess. Yeah. So this is a little bit counterintuitive, but the best way for genetics to improve policy is actually by improving the research on which policy is based. So, if we think about what we're trying in education. Let's try this new curriculum. Let's teach, teach teachers about mindsets. Let's try to retroactively sort of like reverse engineer the characteristics of successful teachers, successful schools, successful school districts, successful parents. Success in this, in this way, I'm saying features of people that are correlated with children doing well in school. That research is easier to do if we have good controls for the fact that children are genetically different from one another. The central problem of most of social science is that kids don't end up in their environments at random. And so is it something that mom is doing that's making the child better at you know, reading when they start school? Or is it that those two things are correlated, but it's not that mom's actually doing it. It's just that's a behavior of moms that's influenced by her temperament and the child is, is inheriting the genes. That problem of being unable to control for genetic differences is absolutely rampant in all of developmental psychology, educational psychology, sociology. Um, and so we are often, very often, trying interventions and policies on the basis of a bad model of what's causing what in child development. And then most of the things, those things don't work, which has a huge opportunity cost and an actual cost, like educational interventions are expensive. So a lot of times when people hear about genetic research linking education, their minds jump to, you know, a teacher is going to do some sort of personalizing in the classroom. Like little Tommy has this genetic score, so he's going to get this reading material. That is not my suggestion at all. My suggestion is that if we want to change the world, we need to understand it better. And researchers who take into account genetic differences between kids have a better chance of understanding the world of human development, of child development better. That's the, that is the entry floor for genetics, and that's where we should be starting. It's a very depressing conclusion, the idea that most interventions <laughs> don't, don't work. But I guess that if, it's better than not knowing that and spending lots more money on them. Um, I have a yeah. question from Emma, uh, who says, if we have to take into account the role of genetic luck that famous some over the others in terms of equality, what are your thoughts on providing equitable opportunities to even things out rather than equal ones? So I think this is one mm. of the most, um, this is the bit in the book that I think will probably have right wing people having some palpitations because you quote Freddie DeBoer talking about equality of opportunity being kind of a, a, a big lie, really. So there's a whole debate about the difference between equality of outcome, the idea of sort of flattening things out versus equality of opportunity. And basically, everybody seems to be on board with equality of opportunity, like giving everyone a fair shake. But if you're coming from this incredibly disadvantaged place in terms, as we've talked about, both maybe in intelligence and in terms of conscientiousness, risk taking, whatever it is, you can't that equality of opportunity is never going to be equal. So that's quite a radical thing to accept and then devise policy solutions on the basis of, right? It is and it isn't. It is radical because I think that we, I mean, you're absolutely right in an American context, there's a lot of support for the idea of equality of opportunity. We're going to treat everyone exactly the same. Everyone's exactly equal under the law. Um, but less support for worrying about inequalities of outcome. And 
in a world in which people are different, teaching, treating everyone exactly the same will necessarily reproduce those differences. Um, it's not radical in one respect, which is that there are occasions in which we already do it. Um, and a piece of legislation that I can find continually fascinating is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was pass passed by the first Bush in 1990. And it is our anti-discrimination act that requires buildings, for instance, to accommodate people with disabilities, right? So you can't just have a staircase, you have to have a wheelchair ramp. Um, that is an example in which the law explicitly says treating everyone exactly the same is not enough to ensure equality of participation. You cannot say, I have a business and everyone can use the same stairs because people are different in their ambulatory functioning and that exact sameness just reproduces differences in their access. What you have to equalize is their, and the, the, the wording of the law is so interesting here, their enjoyment of an accommodation by that piece of business. And that's a really interesting to think it, thing to think about equalizing. We're not equalizing the exact conditions and let's say, well, everyone has the exact same treatment and that's enough. We can wash our hands of worrying about justice. But we're also not concerned with exactly equalizing psychological or physical functioning or even resources. What we're equalizing is um, being in relationships of dignity with one another, no one needs to be carried around the building. Um, the ability to participate in the economy, um, the ability to participate in public life. Um, that is the sort of equity that is often lost in our conversations about equality. So I, again, I'm less interested in equalizing everyone's likelihood of getting a PhD in clinical psychology, which is what my degree is. I'm interested in a society in which there aren't strong bottlenecks to the sort of lives that we feel like are reflective of human dignity. And people can get through through lots of different ways. What are the social wheelchair ramps to, to add to our stairs that we have here? And we already do that in the realm of physical difference in some cases. But we're less able, I think, to imagine our social structures doing that, that sort of thing around psychological difference. Um, so that's the kind of more, more radical reimagining I'm suggesting in this book. Which is probably a good time to ask you whether or not you had more uh, backlash to this book from the left or the right, because there's something in there for, <laughs> something for everyone to disagree with. There's something which... in there for everyone, yes. Which I think, you know, in some ways, on a good day, I think it's a good thing, right? I wrote the book in part to get a conversation started, and I did, I think, successfully do that to the extent that people are responding to it and thinking about, um, you know, which parts they agree with and disagree with. Um, it's been really interesting because I feel like in on social media, it's been probably equal parts far left and far right um, with you know, some people on the far left are really committed to the idea that linking human difference to genetics is bad, full stop, you know, even if you can identify some instrumentally good uses for it. And some people on the far right that are just, um, you know, anything that is like devoted towards equality per se is bad, you know, full stop. Um, what I've been really struck by is the disconnect between the kind of social media chatter and people's um, uh, reaching out to me privately. So the email versus, you know, the email response or the letter response versus Twitter, because my emails have been lovely, actually. They have been people saying, you've made me think differently about my own children. You've made me think differently about my own siblings. You've made me think differently about my own students or how can I help, right? Like I am in this foundation or I'm developing this data resource or I'm in this public policy institute, um, I think this is important. How can we connect it? And those responses for me outweigh any of the kind of social media chatter around it um, because I think it's a sign that there's, there's more serious engagement with the idea. There was a very funny line in the profile of you in The New Yorker about, I think it was after you went on Sam Harris's podcast, about you being submitted to levels of podcasting that were by any standards extreme sustained <laughs> levels of podcasting I love that line yes yes and I sustained thought that was so interesting because 
but I, I and I was very pleased to hear that you had, you had been on Sam Harris's podcast because I do think there is a, an issue about and it came up in lots of discussions we had a couple of years ago about the so-called intellectual dark web that if um, people who self-identify as progressives as you do don't engage with these oh no one wants to talk about this subject you know that they don't want you to know about this you know this is some unspoken truth that the MSM don't want you to hear that is a very very powerful message and one that people find incredibly appealing yeah. the idea that the thing is we all know there are racial differences but you're not allowed to say that right and it needs someone to go in yeah. and say well actually here's here's the evidence on it i'm not going to say this you're being offensive i'm going to say you're you're wrong and that's something mm -hmm. i think that the left has kind of whiffed a little bit recently i agree with that i think so often people say to me you know what are the risks of talking about this this being genetics and I always say it is it is not as if, you know, clinical psychologists doing genetics are over here, like turning the crank of the conversation about genetics in in people's lives. Like this is a topic that people are talking about that they if you ask just lay people, do genetics make an influence on you know your life or your children's life? They say yes. So if if psychologists and geneticists and sociologists who spend our lives thinking about human difference are not engaging. That doesn't make the conversation go away. It just creates this, ooh, it's forbidden knowledge um, kind of uh, aura around it. And I agree with you that I think that's a very dangerous place for it to be. As someone who used to edit a news website, let me tell you that nothing is more clickable than like they people don't want you to know this but like you know yes. any idea that this is sort yeah. of like you're you're being inducted into some kind of mysterious hush hush thing that people don't want yeah. you to know is yeah. even when the you're thing taking that, the red pill or the blue right. pill or whatever which whatever it is yeah I, and i so i think i think it's i think it's it, it's wishful thinking to think if you never talk about genetics, then race realists or whatever they want to call themselves now will, will kind of just go away and stop talking about this. I have one that's very left field here in the questions for you. To what extent okay. does gut microbiome nullify inherited genetics? <laughs> I mean, I love the um, gut microbiome, but yeah, I don't think I. So I don't think anything in. Ter I don't tend to think of levels of information as nullifying each other. Right. So the microbiome is part of the larger set of omics, right? We can think about the genome. We can think about the biome. We can think about the epigenome. We can think about um, the environmental layers of environmental uh, context in which people are. And I am a multi-level, multi-layer thinker. And I am because I think human development is multi-layer and multi-level. So we generally, I don't think we should be thinking about how does one thing nullify each other, but what can we learn from combining those sources of information? Um, so for instance, you know, if you're, I think a really great example of the power of the gut biome is if you're looking at children with um, um, autism, they often have severe epilepsy as a comorbid condition. And one of the um, treatments for epilepsy is a very particular diet. So you're changing what you're putting into your gut and that's changing your, your vulnerability to seizure activity. So obviously, like, you know, our genes don't stop at the neck in either direction and what's happening in one part of our body can be affected by another part of our body. Um, in my lab, we study um, not the gut microbiome, but we do study things like food security and insecurity. So to what extent does that variability in access to um, nutritious, um, uh, fresh food relate to patterns of early puberty or um, DNA methylation patterns that are related to aging. Um, so we're always looking for how can we integrate another level of information about what's going on, particularly when we're talking about um, child development. Which is related to another question that's come up in the chat, which is a, how does epigenetics filter into your work? Yeah, so epigenetics is an interesting word. It's, it's a little bit like eugenics in that it has a lot of different meanings for different people. So well, we give, me a, give me a concise. Yeah. Is, um, am I right in thinking this is about how uh, environment alters the expression of genes? Is that a yeah. way of, one way of yeah. conceptualizing yeah. it? Yes, which and it's absolutely necessary. So, like every cell in your body has the same genome, but your liver cells 
don't look or act like your brain cells. And why is that? Because of epigenetics. There are um, dynamic tissue-specific, developmental, environmentally responsive changes to gene expression that are happening all of the time. My work tends to look at um, one epigenetic signature, which is called DNA methylation. So methyl groups can bond to parts of the genome and that affect its ability to be read and expressed in a certain tissue. Um, and we're interested in DNA methylation because it is correlated with social inequalities. So in Austin, children growing up in poverty show DNA methylation signatures that in adults are associated with earlier mortality and faster biological aging. Um, a lot of times people are interested, when people ask me that question, they're particularly interested in epigenetic inheritance, which is, is something about the way that my genome is expressed as influenced by my environment. It, are those epigenetic signatures passed on to offspring? Um, that's a very controversial field, particularly in humans, and I don't um, personally do anything related to epigenetic inheritance. I'm really looking about over the course of someone's own life, how does their environmental exposures um, relate to these signatures of how genes might be being turned on or turned off um, in certain tissues at certain points in their life. You glance at that a bit in the book by quoting this um, research, which suggests that perhaps, uh, you know, all these anti-smoking measures have made it easier for people who's, who don't have the genetic markers that make you more prone to addiction, right? So all the people who find it easy to quit smoking have quit smoking. Yeah. And so we're now penalizing harder the people who who, who can't, which I think is such a, a fascinating... I remember when um, I was at New States when we had Richard Dawkins guest editing, and he was saying that he had taken uh, a test and he found that he'd got the markers for if you had ever tried smoking you would have found it incredibly addictive and like it just so happened that he'd never you know tried a cigarette and and that seems to me to be part of the interesting message of your book that instead of this very old school eugenics determinist idea that you know you just you're a slave to your genes that there is some measure of we could use this knowledge to help us be more understanding that other people find things harder than we do right like oh i find it so easy to quit smoking or you know thin people are like well i've never had a problem losing weight or whatever it m might be or mm -hmm. um you know in the same way that uh you know that people might be more prone to violent outbursts and and, and rage and, and if you've never felt that you just can't understand what that experience is is like there is a kind of somewhere there a, a plea that people are kind of you know having they're living their lives in a fundamentally different body than you are and a brain experience than you are. And that could make you more empathetic to them, right? Yeah. I mean, I think if we look at the history of many social movements in the U.S. around reducing stigma around mental illness, or this has been quite prominent in gay rights, emphasizing that a biological component to a behavior or to a disposition has been a really important part of demoralizing it to making it a more morally neutral aspect of human difference rather than a thing to be, um, uh, you know, evaluated as good or bad qua in this, in some sort of moral or eth ethical sense. So I think there's, that's one interesting layer of it. I think another interesting layer of it is exactly what you just said, which is contrary to this kind of deterministic perspective on genes we can look at examples in which people might have been at genetic risk for addiction, but now we tax cigarettes immensely and they smoke less, right? That's not a, um, again, we're not crispering their genes. We're not selecting embryos. We're changing tax policy. But in so doing, we're changing the relationship between someone's genetic vulnerabilities and their outcomes. And then also I think it speaks to, you know, all, as, as this research progresses, I say in the book, in the last chapter, I give these kind of principles for anti-eugenic practice and policy. And one of them is, can we think about genetics as a tool, not for classifying people, but for understanding environments? And the tobacco, the tobacco tax one is a great one, which is we can see who has been helped by a policy regime and who has been left behind. What's different about the people who have been left behind what do we need to try differently for people who aren't responding to the incentives of taxation in the way that most of the population does? So it's not about abandoning anyone to their fate. It's about identifying what's working for whom, who's not being served, what do we need to try for them? Um, 
again, it's around having this kind of pluralistic opportunities to success rather than forcing everyone through the same bottleneck. Just before I hand back over to Connor, I want to ask you one final question, which is apart from buying your book, which is both um, <laughs> very, very challenging and provocative and written for the lay reader mind, like there are bits about chicken in it that you in, in the film Parasite that in, in a mostly quite hardcore genetics. Um, what should what is there one thing that people should go away and read or do following on from the lessons you've learned from, from writing this? You know, there's um there is uh, an essay that I wrote for Eon earlier this year that's about, it's called, What Do We Do With the Science of Terrible Men? And it's a play on Emily uh, Nussbaum's co column on what do we do with the art of terrible men? And it's struggling with, we know that genetics has this eugenic legacy. We know that statistics has this eugenic legacy. How can we reclaim those tools for more positive ends while still recognizing the deep moral limitations and ideological limitations of the inventors of these tools? So if you're not ready to commit to buying the book, um, you can just Google Paige Harden, what do we do with the science of terrible men? And I think it's a good introduction to many of these issues. That is a great recommendation. Thank you very much.